This is the spectacular Qinghai Tibet Plateau with its snowy peaks, blue sky and bright sun. The Patala Palace on the roof of the world is also a spectacular sight. The merciful Avalokitesvara, also known as Guan Yin, has been sitting in the center of the palace for 1,300 years. Patala Palace is like a pearl on the snowy plateau. It is an architectural wonder with a fascinating history. And in Tibetan Buddhism, it is considered sacred. This is Maijor Kunga, 40 kilometers from Lhasa. According to legend, Songsten Gampo, the 33rd ruler of Tubo, was born here in the 7th century. Songsten Gampo unified the Tibetan tribes, made laws, standardized weights and measures, and invented the local written language. On Red Hill in the Lhasa River Valley, he built a magnificent palace with 999 rooms. The palace was called, in Tibetan, the Treasure Palace on Red Hill. These frescoes can give us an idea of how it looked at the time. That palace, however, didn't survive. Today, only the Dharma King Cave and Guanyin Hall remain. While the palace was being built, Sungsten Gampo lived in the Dharma King Cave. It is one of the oldest buildings inside the Patala Palace complex. Here one can see statues of Sungsten Gampo, Tang Princess Wencheng, and Nepalese Princess Burkuti, as well as statues of Sungsten Gampo's main ministers. Each sculpture was created in the Tibetan style. After unifying Tibet by force, Songsten Gampo introduced Buddhism to unify the people ideologically. First, he sent for this sculpture from India, the eleven-faced Avalokitesvara. The statue was precious for more than just its artistic value. According to Tibetan history books, this sculpture was not carved, but formed naturally inside a sandalwood tree. Over the years, it's been repeatedly gilded. Tibetan people believe that Guanyin has a special relationship with Tibet. This mural inside the Potala Palace depicts Guan Yin's monkey, who had six red-faced meat-eating children with a female demon in Tibet. These six children were the ancestors of the Tibetan people. 
For this reason, Guanyin is very special to the Tibetan people. Tibetans also believe that Songsen Gampo was an incarnation of Guanyin. Naturally, the place where he lived was Guanyin's temple. For this reason, the name of Songsten Gampo's palace was changed to Patala Palace, which in Tibetan means the place where Guanyin lived. After the name of the palace was changed, Songsten Princess Burkuti from Nepal. As part of her dowry, this life-size sculpture of the eight-year-old Sakyamuni was sent to Tibet. The sculpture is now inside Ramochur Temple. Before long, Songsten Gampo sent an envoy to ask for the hand of a Tang princess. This famous painting of Emperor Taizong receiving the envoy was painted by Tang court artist Yan Li Ben. In the year 641 AD, the 16-year-old princess Wen Chang reluctantly left the capital, Chang'an. The princess was accompanied by 300 workers with various skills and two warriors. The warrior's only task was carrying the life-sized statue of 12-year-old Sakyamuni in the carriage. It took three years for them to reach Lhasa. The statue brought by Princess Wencheng is now in Jokang Temple near Lhasa. Jokang Temple is, in fact, three kilometers southeast of Lhasa. For Buddhists, this temple is the center of the world. Every day, Literally thousands of Buddhist monks and believers come here. Of all the statues of Sakyamuni, only the two of him as a child were made according to his actual height when Sakyamuni was alive, and he personally performed the consecration ceremony. To Buddhists, these two statues are Sakyamuni incarnate. Viewing either one is believed to be equivalent to seeing Sakyamuni in person. Followers of Buddhism come a very long way to receive this statue's blessing. Some even kowtow every three steps of the long journey.
Like most temples built on a plain, Jokhang Temple is surrounded by other buildings for various functions. Their arrangement obviously does not follow Han custom. The golden roofs of these buildings, however, reflect Tibetan architecture influenced by Han customs. This shows that in the 7th century, Han, Tibetan and Indian styles were blended in Buddhist architecture. Jokang Temple contains the statue of the 12-year-old Sakyamuni that Princess Wenchang brought to Tibet, even though the temple was originally built for the statue of the 8-year-old Sakyamuni. There's an interesting story behind this mystery. After Princess Wenchang died, there were rumors that the Tang army was coming to seize the statue. For this reason, the senior monks from Jokang Temple switched the statues. After the statue of the 12-year-old Sakyamuni was moved into Jokang Temple, the door was sealed up with mud. After the rumor died out, the door was unsealed and the statue remained in Jokang Temple. Trial Pachen, a 9th century Tubor leader, went to great lengths in his dedication to Buddhism. Every seven households were ordered to support one monk, and officials were ordered to salute monks, but not vice versa. Under these policies, the number of temples and monks dramatically increased, eventually exceeding the people's capacity to support them. The greatly decreased government revenue increased internal government disputes. In the end, Trairo Pachin was murdered by government ministers and his younger brother, Dharma Wudang, who then took his place. The younger brother quickly began severely suppressing Buddhism, as no one had done before in Tibetan history. Temples were demolished, Sutras were destroyed, and monks were dismissed and forced into secular life. The Jokang and Ramosh temples became slaughterhouses, and the two Sakyamuni statues were buried beside the river. After the death of Dharma Wudang, the Tubor kingdom collapsed. The Batala palace was left empty. Over time, the weather gradually reduced the palace to ruins. In the early 9th century, Tibet entered an era of fragmentation. In the 13th century, the Mongolian army conquered Tibet and made it part of the Yuan dynasty. Ever since, Tibet has been an inseparable part of Chinese territory. As a grand councillor of the Yuan Emperor Kublai Khan, a Tibetan by the name of Fagpa played a crucial role in improving relations between the Mongols and Tibetans. The seal Kublai Khan gave to Fagpa is now in the Museum of the Tibetan Autonomous Region. 
The written language Fagpa created became one of the official languages of the Yuan Dynasty. This is Song Kapa, founder of the Gurlug school of Tibetan Buddhism. Song Kapa came to Lhasa in the early 15th century to rebuild Jokang Temple. On Tibetan New Year's Day of the year 1409, Tsung Kapa convened the first Buddhist ceremony inside the newly restored Jokang Temple. From this time on, Jokang Temple became a major venue for religious activities. Song Kapa thus restored the status of Jokang Temple in Buddhism and attracted many disciples. Song Kapa's most prominent students were Gu Duen Drup and Gu Drop Jiu. Gu Duen Drup was the first Dalai Lama. Gu Drop Jiu was the first Panchen Lama. A plaque from Qing Emperor Tongzhi still hangs in the Red Palace of Patala Palace. On the walls around the plaque are portraits of past incarnations of the Dalai Lama. One of the portraits is of Sonam Gyatso, the first to be granted the title of Dalai Lama by Mongolian ruler Atlan Khan. Atlan Khan describes Sonam Gyatso as a master with knowledge as vast as the sea. This was, in fact, the first time the title of Dalai Lama was granted. After receiving the title, Sonam Gyatso posthumously granted it to his two predecessors, making him the third Dalai Lama. This was the beginning of the Dalai Lama system. Beginning in the 16th century, Sung Kapa's Gurlog school of Tibetan Buddhism became increasingly influential in both Tibet and Mongolia. Each Dalai Lama maintained close ties with the Mongolian leaders. In the year 1642, the fifth Dalai Lama, Lozang Gyatso, backed by the Mongolian ruler, unified Tibet. This event is depicted on the second floor of the Red Palace in these frescoes. The fifth Dalai Lama decided to rebuild Batala Palace on Red Hill. In the year 1645, he presided over the foundation ceremony for the White Palace. It was, however, another three years before the White Palace was completed. 
the Red Palace wasn't completed until 42 years later. In 1694, the spectacular Portala Palace once again stood on Red Hill. The newly rebuilt Portala Palace was 116 meters tall with a floor space of almost 140,000 square meters. Building this palace on a sloping mountainside without digging into the ground for the foundation was quite a feat considering the available technology of the time. Workers built walls of differing heights of rammed earth and rocks to create a level surface. They then covered them with logs and broken poplar tree branches to form the foundation. foundation can be seen below the palace floor. This type of foundation allows for ventilation. Fresh air and sunshine come in through these skylights for good air circulation. Even though the walls are five meters thick, the inside of the palace is well lit well ventilated, cool in summer, and warm in winter. There are three sections in the Patala Palace symbolizing the realm of desire, the realm of the tangible, and the realm of the intangible. The square building in front of the hill stands for the realm of worldly desires. The White Palace is where the Dalai Lama lives and works. The Red Palace contains the soul pagodas of the past ten Dalai Lamas. The color of each chamber is significant. White represents mercy. Red represents wisdom and strength. And gold represents supreme power. The original palace built by Sultan Gampur was destroyed by fire caused by lightning. To prevent this problem in the new palace, gilded brass lightning rods were installed on the gilded roof and the walls were decorated with bronze depictions of the eight treasures. Any lightning strike would hit the rods, go down the wires to the eight treasures on the wall, and then pass harmlessly into the ground. These lightning rods have protected the palace now for over 300 years. After it was completed, the fifth generation Dalai Lama Yilozan Gyatso moved his government offices from Jokang Temple into the new Patala Palace. Once again, the political and religious center of Tibet was on Red Hill. The fifth Dalai Lama knew that he needed the support of the central government to maintain his rule. This being the case, in 1652, 
Qing Emperor Shun Zhi summoned the 5th Dalai Lama to the Forbidden City over 4,000 kilometers away. Emperor Shun Zhi gave the Dalai Lama a very courteous reception. He even built a special temple for him just for his stay in the capital. That temple is Beijing's Yellow Temple. Today, the Yellow Temple is the highest college for Tibetan Buddhist studies. On January the 15th of the year 1653, 14-year-old Emperor Shunzhi met with the 35-year-old Dalai Lama Luozang Gyatso. The long trip Luozang Gyatso made to Beijing is depicted on the walls of the Red Palace. Luozang Gyatso returned to Tibet with many gifts from the emperor, including a so-called golden seal. His trip confirmed the Qing government's recognition of local Tibetan rule by the Dalai Lama and recognition of his title. In the Tibetan language, Norbo Linka, built especially for the Dalai Lama, means treasured garden. Norbo Linka was built around 1740 as a summer palace for the Dalai Lama. It occupies an area of 360,000 square meters, making it 60 hectares larger than Beijing's summer palace. Before the palace was built, this area was a wilderness area with wild animals and heavy bush. The Qing minister stationed in Tibet enjoyed coming here for pleasure every summer when he met with the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama built Liang Ting Palace here for the minister. In the year 1751, the seventh Dalai Lama had a palace built on the east side of the palace and named it after himself. Succeeding Dalai Lamas renovated and expanded Nobulinka until it reached its present size. These sutra banners fluttering in the wind indicate the arrival of another Tibetan New Year. Batala Palace and a Jokhang Temple are always crowded. Lighting a butter candle is the Tibetan way of praying for world peace and local prosperity. Here, the infinitely merciful Guanyin blesses the world. It is Guanyin's wish that everyone in the world finds the spiritual peace they seek in the profound Tibetan culture. <laughs> 